Hello there, ultrasound enthusiasts. My name is Anthony Medock. I'm a faculty member in the UC San Diego Department of Emergency Medicine, and welcome to our intern point of care ultrasound boot camp. Um, this is going to be a focused lecture on an overview and introduction to echocardiography, a particular uh, application of POCUS that I think is very relevant, very fun, and very useful, something you can use pretty much on your next shift. So let's kind of jump right in. But before we do, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an idea as to why this may be important. I know many people out there kind of want to be fit and they don't have a lot of time. So there's all kinds of ways you can try to get fit and do it quickly. Like maybe you've heard of five minute abs or you can get toned, get fit and uh, kind of get in shape without using a whole lot of time. I know uh, our own uh, illustrious fa faculty member, Dr. Amir Amindlery is a big fan of this program, but this is even better because first there was five minute abs. Now we have something that's twice as good and that's 10 minute echo. So what we're going to be doing here is covering just the basics because we don't have a lot of time. We're going to talk about probe placement, the probe orientation for doing bedside echocardiography, and we're going to talk about the four principal cardiac windows. So let's kind of jump right in. So here are the four windows, the subcostal, otherwise known as the subxiphoid view. You may already be familiar with this because it's part of the fast examination. Then we'll be talking about the parasternal long axis view. We'll be talking about the parasternal short axis view. And then lastly, we'll talk about the apical four chamber view. We'll talk about how you get each one of those, talk about some tips and tricks, and then wrap up. Before we jump into the individual windows and views, I just want to make you aware of one important thing. Most of the time when we're doing point of care ultrasound, if you look at the orientation marker on the screen, when you're getting the image, it's going to be on the top left. However, for echocardiography, uh, the orientation conventions are a bit different. The screen orientation is going to be at the top right of the screen. If you have questions as to why, that's kind of a conversation for another day. Speak to any of us face-to-face -face or next time you're on shift and we can talk a bit about it. But in the interest of time, just remember, echocardiography screen convention in terms of orientation is going to be top right of the screen, which is counter to the way we do most of everything else in bedside ultrasound. And along the same lines, when you talk about probe orient orientation, when we talk about looking at the gallbladder or the aorta or the thyroid or the eye or anything else, we generally, the conventions are as follows. If you're going to be imaging a patient in a longitudinal orientation, the probe marker dot is pointed towards the patient's head. And if you're going to be scanning the patient in a transverse plane, you want to put the probe orientation marker towards the patient's right. Unfortunately, when it comes to echocardiography, there is no single correct probe orientation. It depends on what view you're going to obtain. So for each of the views we're going to go over, you're going to notice we have to talk about where you put the probe and where you put the probe marker dot so that you get the views and they look the same as anyone else doing the same exam all over the world. So again, the orientation and the conventions are different for echo compared to the other applications of bedside ultrasounds. Just keep that in mind. There's a few different ways you can try to keep this in memory. The way I like to teach it and the way we do it even with our medical students is using the analogy of a clock face. So just keep that in mind as we kind of go through the next couple slides. So um, here is a cartoon of an individual. You can see the cardiac structures in the chest. Now, if we talk about the four windows, the first one we're going to obtain is the subcostal view, where we're going to put the probe marker dot just underneath the xiphoid process. And this arrowhead recommends where we're going to be putting the probe marker dot. It's going to be towards the patient's left flank. Then the next view that we're going to obtain is the parasternal long axis view. So we're going to move our probe and put it just on the left uh, sternal border, and the probe marker dot will be towards the right shoulder. Next will be the parasternal short axis. We're going to rotate 90 degrees and put the probe marker dot towards the left shoulder. And then lastly, the fourth and final view is the apical four chamber, where we're going to return and basically come full circle and have the orientation marker towards the left flank. So the clock analogy is as follows. If you do the exam in this order, one, two, three, four, you're going to place the probe marker dot and start in the left flank. Imagine that you're just kind of rotating in a clockwise orientation to the right shoulder. For the next window, you're going to come 90 degrees to the left shoulder, and then you're going to continue in a clockwise orientation for the fourth and final view to the left flank. So basically, you've done one full revolution when you do a full transthoracic echo. One, two, three, and four. In terms of the technique, you want to make sure that you tell the, the, the ultrasound machine that you're going to be doing a cardiac exam, and that will turn on uh, tissue harmonic imaging, which will give you a better image. It'll also automatically invert the screen image so that the orientation marker is towards the top right of the screen so that your image doesn't appear flipped. Lastly, you want to make sure you select the phased array transducer. As you notice, it has a particularly small footprint which will allow you to fit in between the ribs easily. So let's jump in. 
The first view we're going to talk about is a subcostal, otherwise known as a subxiphoid view. You're going to place the probe right here in the epigastrium, just inferior to the xiphoid process, and you need to apply a little bit of pressure. And again, orientation marker is going to be towards the patient's left flank. Now, in this video, when we start this off, you're going to notice initially that the sonographer's hand is underneath the probe, and when you try to drop the angle of the probe down so you get a nice shallow angle to look at the heart, your hand gets in the way. So what you want to do is actually hold the probe from on top of the transducer, almost as though you're holding kind of an ice cream scooper. And if you hold it in that fashion, you'll see you'll be able to get a better image of the heart. Check this out. So again, we apply some steady pressure. Here the sonographer is trying to drop the angle, but you can't get shallow enough. So if you change your orientation such that you put your hand on top of the probe, you can apply that steady pressure, angle the beam towards the left shoulder, and then you can drop your angle to where you're almost flat. And now you can get a straight shot looking right at the heart. So that's how you obtain the subcostal view. Here's what you'll get in terms of an ultrasound image like so, and here's a corresponding cartoon. So in the near field or the top of the image, you're going to see some liver parenchyma, and then the most anterior structure of the heart is the right ventricle, septum, left ventricle, and then your corresponding atria. Here's what that looks like in a video clip. Again, liver parenchyma in what we call the near field or the top half of the screen, right ventricle, interventricular septum, left ventricle, and corresponding atria. And if we take away the labels, you can see it right there. This is a very nice example of a subcostal view without any pathology, so this is normal. All right, so now let's talk about uh, the cardiac window number two, and that's the parasternal long axis. Ideally, you're going to want to obtain this image with the patient lying in left lateral decubitus. You can certainly try to do it with the patient supine, but in general, you'll get better windows if you have them rolled over with their left side down. You're going to place the transducer at roughly the fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum, with the orientation marker pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. And when you do so, you'll be imaging the heart in this long axis plane. So this is the plane that you'll be essentially bisecting the heart. And this particular view is great for assessing left ventricular function, which we will talk about in a future video in terms of how you can estimate left ventricular function with this particular view. And in addition, you'll notice that at these next couple of slides, you'll notice that we don't get very much information about the right heart. So the parasternal long axis is great for left ventricular assessment, but it's not very good for looking at the right heart. For that, you'll have to rely upon the apical four chamber view, which we will also discuss today. So here's what the, a typical parasternal long axis view will look like. In terms of the ultrasound image, you're going to have the left atrium at the bottom of the screen, the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. This is the left ventricle. And then we have the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve like so. The very top of the, the screen, what you're going to get is a bit of the right ventricle, specifically the right ventricular outflow tract. Here's what that looks like in video form. As you can see, again, left atrium, mitral valve. You can see some of the chordae tendinae and papillary muscle here. This is all left ventricle, left ventricular outflow tract, and a bit of the right ventricular outflow tract as well. This is a normal view. Here it is without the labels. And one thing that is kind of subtle here, but if you look closely, you can see this hypoechoic area deep to the left atrium. That is the descending thoracic aorta. That can be very helpful in a couple of these transthoracic um, windows because it can act as a source of uh, orientation as a landmark. If you can identify the descending aorta, generally it's going to be just posterior to the left atrium. So that's a good landmark that you should get familiar with. All right, so now let's talk about the parasternal short axis. This is view number three that we'll be talking about today. The nice thing about this view is that essentially all you need to do is rotate from right shoulder of parasternal long axis, rotate 90 degrees towards left shoulder for parasternal short axis. So for this, you want to place the probe again in the exact same position, fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternal border. But instead of being oriented with the probe marker dot to the right shoulder, rotate 90 degrees and bring it to the left shoulder. And that's how you interchange from the parasternal long to the parasternal short axis view. Here's a video. So here we're in parasternal long axis. Now we simply rotate. You can see the marker dot going to the contralateral shoulder. And now we're ready to obtain a parasternal short axis view. When we do that, you have to keep in mind that depending on at what level of the heart you're slicing it, if you slice it near the base of the heart, you'll be looking at the uh, aortic valve level. If you slice the heart kind of in the mid portion, you'll be looking at the level of the mitral valve. And if you slice the heart in short axis near the apex of the heart, you'll see the papillary muscle. So again, to do this, you're not going to actually physically move the probe on the chest wall. All you're going to do is fan or angle your transducer slightly differently to go from this view to this view to this view. Here's some examples. So this is the parasternal short axis at the aortic valve level. 
So this is the annulus of the aortic valve. You can see the leaflets of the aortic valve there. And then just by way of orientation, just so that you know, this is left atrium, right atrium, tricuspid valve, and right ventricle. But the main thing to note here is the tricuspid nature of this aortic valve and the connective tissue hyperechoic annulus that you can see here. If I take away the labels, you can see that many people often refer to the appearance of this tricuspid aortic valve with its hyperechoic leaflets. It looks a bit like a Mercedes-Benz sign. So you can kind of see those leaflets like so. So if you hear someone say, oh, there's the Mercedes sign. The Mercedes sign is the aortic valve um, in short axis. All right, so now if we basically fan just slightly, so we look at the level of the mitral valve, here's the mitral valve in short axis. Now here's a nice view because you're getting a circumferential view of the left ventricle, the right ventricle abuts it, and here you can see the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. And with each cardiac cycle, as that valve opens and closes, it kind of resembles almost like a mouth kind of opening and closing as you're looking right at it. So some people will sometimes refer to this as kind of the quote unquote fish mouth view when you're looking at the mitral valve and it's opening and closing with each cardiac cycle. So fish mouth kind of refers to the mitral valve in short axis. Finally, the third level at which we often discuss the parasternal short axis is when we actually slice the heart near the apex of the heart. And in doing so, that will be the best way to visualize the papillary muscle. So in cartoon form, what we're going to be looking at is this kind of, again, short axis kind of circumferential view of the left ventricle, but near the apex. So the chamber of the heart of the left ventricle here will actually be much smaller. And you'll see these kind of um, protuberances from within the chamber that represent the anterior and posterior papillary muscles. You'll notice that on the subsequent ultrasound clip, this musculature is a bit hyperechoic. So again, here we're just basically fanning a little bit more towards the apex as compared to our mitral valve view, and we're getting a circumferential view of the distal left ventricle near the apex. And if I take away the labels, you can actually see the hyperechoic papillary muscle right here, which to me looks a little bit like a smiley face. You kind of have eyeball, eyeball, and then kind of this smiley face in between. So the nice thing about this view is you can get a circumferential look at that left ventricular function and get an idea of how good that myocardium is squeezing at that portion. So this is a very helpful view. I would say of the parasternal short axis views, this distal papillary muscle level is the most helpful in terms of assessing left ventricular function. Finally, we're going to talk about the apical four chamber, which in many regards is probably the most helpful of the four views. In particular, it's great for looking at left heart function as well as right heart function, as well as looking and assessing for regurgitation and other valvular abnormalities. To get this view, I highly encourage you have the patient roll over in left lateral decubitus. You're going to want to have the patient lift their left arm up to open up those rib spaces, and then simply place the probe wherever you palpate the PMI. If you can't easily palpate the PMI, you can just use surface anatomy and go just a finger breadth or so inferior to the nipple or just underneath the breast in a female. Again, orientation marker is going to be towards the left flank. In doing so, essentially we're going to be placing the transducer right over the apex of the heart and we're going to be shooting our beam down the long axis of the heart with the top of the screen, which is where we're physically placing the transducer representing the apex, and the bottom of the ultrasound image will represent the base of the heart. So here we are. Imagine we're placing our transducer right here over the apex. We're shooting our beam down the long axis of the heart so that in the near field we have our left ventricle and right ventricle, and in the far field we have our corresponding atria. Sometimes for rookies it can be a little bit confusing what's left heart and what's right heart, and what I'll say is as long as you follow the conventions and this marker dot is on the top right of the screen, everything on this side of the screen is going to be left heart, everything on this side of the screen is going to be right heart, and if you're ever uncertain, Remember that there's that landmark that we talked about earlier, and that is the descending aorta. If you can identify the descending aorta, then of course you know this is left atrium, and then you can intuit the rest in terms of what chamber uh, is what on your ultrasound image. All right, so in closing, there's just a couple things that I want you to remember. The most important thing is that you have to keep in mind that the orientation rules for echocardiography are different from all the other point-of-care ultrasound exams that you're learning or you may already be familiar with. And if you remember from the very beginning of doing the exam to set the machine in a cardiac mode, the machine and the software will automatically invert the image and will turn on the appropriate internal parameters so you get the best image when you're doing your exam. Patient position is really key. I'd say essentially with the exception of the subcostal view in which you can do it with the patient supine, just do the exam if the patient will tolerate it in a left lateral decubitus position and that will alleviate a lot of possible frustrations. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, if you have any questions, you can hit me up via email or on Twitter. Um, I hope you found this informative and looking forward to work with you in the years to come. Take care.